Let's take our Bibles. Let's go over to Colossians chapter 3, please. Colossians chapter 3. Verses 22 through 25. As we've been discussing throughout this series, and especially over the last few months, talking about how the Lord laid out putting on the new man. And that new man changes how we are as a person, changes who we are as a husband, a wife, a father and a mother, and children. But it also changes who we are as a Christian in the workforce. Now, when this was written, I know we have a lot of people in the world trying to eradicate the idea that United States, Canada, and the world perpetrated slavery. That is not a new thing. And even today, from the voice of the martyrs, there's over 12 million people still enslaved. And, and what bothers me is Christians are trying to change the past, but God never called us to change anyone but give them the gospel. I can't change you. I can't change you. I can't change anybody but me. And that's through the gospel of Jesus Christ. How does people change? By getting saved. Amen? How does a drunkard stop drinking? How does a person start uh, stealing or murdering or beating on someone? You get a change of heart. And this is the thing, is also, where is the world with all the slaves today? If it's still prevalent today for, there is over 2 million people in sex trafficking, the ages of 12 to 17. Where's the voice in that? I can't change what my ancestors do. And I'm from Norway. They did a lot of brutal things for almost 600 years. I can't change what the Norwegians did in 1000 AD. I can't change who I was in the past because I was not there. <laughs> I was born in 1972, not in 1872, not in 1772. I was born here. However, what about doing what Christians should do today? We spend so much time trying to change things that cannot ever change. But why don't we change us? Why don't we better be better employees? Why don't we better be better fathers? Why don't we better uh, business owners or bosses? Sad thing is, I've been in the corporate world, and you know what the worst thing was? Selling to Christians. That was sad. Christians were the first to rip me off. Now, I'll put great big quotations around them because a real Christian will not steal, will not rip off, will not this. It's easy to say, oh, I'm a Christian. But it's hard to live a Christian life without Christ. Christian work ethics is biblical based. It is essential to be that type of person. We at Community have put a good foot forward in our community as being honest and trustworthy. People that I've dealt with, we have had to pay back debts that other people have accrued. We have had to make things right at the cost of us financially, but it's worth it because it's the right thing to do, amen? Regardless if I accrued it or did it, the name associated with the church did. And this is the great thing about it. You do the right thing, and guess who's going to bless you? God. We are the right employee. We may not have the right boss, but if they don't know the Lord, they'll never be the right boss. But our obligation is simple. Work as unto the Lord. And there are some things I've worked for some bosses that are not nice. No matter what I did, they doubled the work just to make me quit. Most of you probably work for bosses like that. No matter how hard you tried, it was never good enough. But I promise you, if God gave me the job, I'm not going to let a man or woman run me off of the job. I'm that hard-headed. And I've worked with some bosses that I would work for from now until eternity. They were good people. And you know what? When I got up for work, I was ready to go to work because I enjoyed work. When I worked for other bosses that were not, 
I was kind of looking for the paycheck to get out and go, go somewhere else. But you know, the thing is, quitting a job to go somewhere else because the atmosphere is not good in the sense where some bosses are mean. If God has got you there, there is a place and there is a time and there is a season. There were times God did not allow me to stay long in jobs. There were times that God allowed me to stay way longer than I wanted to stay. But that's where God had me. And that's where over the years I realized what matters the most is the character God gave you. You are their ambassador of Jesus Christ. You are sometimes the only gospel they will ever see. I wish every one of us had the opportunity working for Christian companies. I mean, real Christian companies. But that's not always the case. How do we, how does Paul address? When he wrote the book of Colossians, just like when he wrote everything, he wrote to the masters. And yes, today we do not have masters in the sense that he did. But the thing is, we're all master to something. If I didn't do what my boss says, they fired me. Cruel as that may seem, they did. I've only been fired twice in my life. One, because the company took another direction and they were cutting all the top layers off. And I was in the top layer. Another one, I was fired wrongly. But however, God made a way both times. But regardless, it's embarrassing, amen, for the older generation to get fired. It's just plumb embarrassing. I got fired today. <laughs> you know, today it's like a badge of honor. I got fired today. <laughs> no, not me. It was a badge of disgrace. But you think about what the Bible says here. And when Paul's dealing with it, he wants to encourage the Christians. Remember, he's going into a dark, immoral society of the Roman Empire. Christianity is relatively new. It's less than 50 years old. And that's a long, short time. Amen? It seems like a long, 50 years old, that's a, that's a long time. But it's a short time to perpetrate the world that has been embedded with satanic religion. And that's what idol worship is. And here Paul is trying to change the thinking after the heart has changed. Every one of us has come from different backgrounds. And every one of us has traits that were passed on by our parents. And that's, it's built in who we are. Why? For 18 years they ground different attributes, different characters, and you can't just throw them away. You were taught them. Now Paul has to unteach them. Just like we got to do our world today. The church is not the social warrior. It's the spiritual warrior. Amen? Amen. Only the church through Jesus Christ can change the heart. And through the hearts of men changed, it makes us men and women of the cross. And that's what Paul is dealing with. It. He knows. How can you take on the monster of Rome when they are killing just as many Christians as other slaves? How can you, one person, take on Nero? You can't. But you know what he does? He takes on one soul at a time. Just like I mentioned Wednesday night. What a, what a blessing for those soldiers to draw that straw to guard Paul. You see, that wasn't a blessing for them. It was if they got saved. I imagine it wasn't a good thing to be, take your boot over to him and going, okay, you can shackle me to that preacher. <laughs> but can you imagine after he got saved going, thank you, Lord, for shackling me. Thank you, Lord, for sending me to that prison for those six months so that I could hear the gospel. And you know what? Many of your ancestors may be a derivative of that soldier who went to Britannia or went to another part of the world on guard duty and led someone to the Lord who led some of the Lord. You know, it'd be interesting. I can't wait to heaven to see how the world came all about through Christians. Where did the gospel go to get to me? 
Where did it come from? Who got saved? Who got saved? Who got saved? Who got saved? To be able to lead my mom to the Lord. Who led Mrs. Goforth to the Lord? In Nova Scotia to lead my mom to the Lord in Chifu, China. You know, that's amazing. The ties you see around all this is like, wow. And who led that person that led you to the Lord and so on and so forth. This is the important thing about being a child of God is we will never know the impact until eternity. And when we work is a great testimony. I remember my dad, he was the foreman of Sun Valley Bold Farm and God touched his heart to leave and go to Bible school. And he told his boss he was leaving. And his boss tried to persuade him to stay, but he knew God wanted him in the ministry. God wanted to be fishers of men. So he packed up four small children, and in his 30s began Bible college. So he chose night, day school and worked nights. So he worked at the Montgomery Ward Warehouse in El Cerrito, California, during the night while going to school during the day and being a father of four kids. The problem was they had a quota every night. And that quota was to be met. And if it was to be met, they were supposed to start on the other night's quota. I mean, remember, they're stocking stores. This is like working for the big Canadian tire warehouse. You got to load a trailer, and if you load that trailer, you get to load another one so it can go all over Canada. But the people he worked with only did the quota for that night. And the rest of the night, no matter if it took them four hours, they sat around for the next four hours, having coffee, reading the paper. And my dad, with his little hand cart, here he is, continuing to load the second truck. And they kept saying, Malin, stop that. You're making us look bad. Don't do that. Sit down. Enjoy. You're getting paid for the eight hours. You loaded your trailer, so there you go. You're good. Dad goes, no. If I sit down for an extra four hours and do nothing, I'm stealing four hours of work. And I can't do that. For the entire time, the men hated my dad for working. But all of us have been trained to work. If my boss is paying me X amount, of, I want to give him that time. Why? The Bible says, do as unto the Lord. And the Bible says here in verse 22, servants, obey in all things unto your master according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Let's pray tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and Lord help us, challenge us to pass on the knowledge that you've given us, the work ethic you've given us to our next generation, that each and every Christian that we come in contact would be able to challenge to be good Christian workforce. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for the service this morning. Use this message, I pray, to always keep you in mind whenever we work, whether for ourselves or for you or for our employers. May it be done to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. When you look at how Paul addresses this, servants, obey in all things your master according to the flesh. We think about what he's dealing with. And it's a harsh reality that the world has not always been black and white. The world has not always been kind to those nations that are conquered. We've seen it all throughout time. We saw what happened in the 1930s when Nazi Germany took over the world. They almost eradicated the entire Polish workforce for slave labor. You think about this, after the war there were less than 100,000 Polish Jews left. Millions were exterminated. And this was not only that, you think about all of Russia has exterminated. Over 25 million people have been killed in the gulags. China, over 30 million. And there's still 
persecuting people today. North Korea, untold. It has been man's worst nightmare when dictators get involved with mankind. We've seen headlines from Laos, Cambodia, all during the 70s, in South America, in Africa. The carnage is real. It is not just a bygone error. It is today. We've seen what the Taliban has done. We've seen what this has done. It's real. Man's heart is deceitful and without Christ, mankind and fellow mankind means nothing. Dealing with the military, I've seen a lot of men come back broken for how they've seen people treated. Folks, this was dealing with the heart. Paul knew that he said, servants, how do we reach someone for Jesus Christ? By being the Christian God would have us be. He understood that he could may not be able to free. He could not even free Onesimus from Philemon. But he says, Onesimus, go back home and be the Christian. But Philemon is a Christian. Let me teach him. That's what the book of Philemon is about. Between 1525 and 1866, the entire history of the slave trade in the New World, they brought 12.5 million Africans were shipped to the New World. However, 10 million survived and disembarked in North America, Caribbean, and South Africa, or South America. And you ready for this? This is PBS. Only 388,000 came to America and Canada. The rest of it went to Brazil, Argentina, and the Caribbean to work in the vast plantations of the Spaniards and the British landowners. When I read that today, I was kind of floored because I was expecting the way people talk, they all came to the United States. 388,000 actually came to America and 23,000 came to Canada via Halifax. We never mentioned that. But the rest went to Brazil, Argentina, to run the vast landowners and all the Caribbean where all the sugar cane, the wheat, and other things were made to feed the world. Between 1790, when the United States gained its freedom, to 1865, they had approximately 3.9 million slaves. And you ready for this? Despite the change in laws in the late 1800s, Brazil was the last country in the Americas to abolish slavery in the 1890s. The last country to actually abolish slavery in the world legally was a country in Africa in 1981, but they still have an average of 300,000 slaves a year today. Slavery was an established institution in Paul's day, and Rome had a staggering 60 one million slaves. Man, that just blew me away when I read that. 61 million slaves in Paul's day. I, I can't even fathom that. That is twice the size of Canada across the world were enslaved by the Roman Empire. Now you think about this. From 1525 to 1866, 10 million slaves came to the Americas. From the time Paul was alive, and at the time he wrote this, was a staggering 61 million slaves. Six times the amount in that 200 year period shipped to America, the Americas. And I'm thinking, wow. How c can you imagine Paul, who loved all men, who wept for all men? Can you imagine how his heart broke as he was a slave a lot of times? You think, of, slave, what difference is it? He was bound in chains. He was shipped from here to there. He was in prisons. Most of the books were after prison or in prison or before prison. He seemed to always be cycling. Chains, whether you're a prisoner, and he was wrongly imprisoned, 99% of the time. 
and you think about Paul's attitude. How many slaves did he come about? He came across Onesimus and led him to the Lord. It must have broke his heart. And you and I, as we walk through this life, we see the people around us. And you know what? I look at people today and we're all enslaved. That's what Jesus Christ said. He's come to set the captive free. You know how many people are enslaved to alcohol, to drugs, to the almighty dollar? They're working for the next dollar and they just, it's like a drug. They got to, oh, we got to do this. If I get this, I can get this car. And if I get this, I get this bigger house. And if I get this, forget our family. Forget our husband. Forget our wife. Forget our children. But if I just get this, we're all enslaved. We just don't see it. And this is where Paul is dealing. And you know, we look around, why didn't the church do anything? How much impact do we really have in Durham region? As a church, really. Does the world listen to Christians? Do you think the world was listening to that small, tiny sect out of Jerusalem? Mm, I don't think so. You know how Paul did it? One soul at a time. You know how we do it, folks? One soul at a time. That's how we reach the world. That one light at a time. I take my candle, me in my corner, you and yours, and we light the next candle, and we light the next candle, and we light the next candle, and that's how we change the world. I know many Christians that have got into politics, and politics have ruined Christians. I know many Christians that said, well, I'm going to be the great businessman and I'm going to get in this business I'm going to, and it's ruined them. How do we change it? How do we change a politician? Lead him to Christ. How do we change the businessman? Lead him to Christ. How do we change the doctors? Lead him to Christ. How do we change the police officers? Lead him to Christ. You know what? If we all were Christians, a lot of things would be stopping why? Because we love the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. But see, we don't go after that avenue. Heaven forbid that avenue might work. <laughs> let's change the laws, let's change this, and yes, that's great. But folks, if we're not changing the heart, Billy Sunday said nothing will change. And he said that in the 1920s. And I think he's right, don't you? Here was a professional baseball player. You know what broke his heart? He tried to go reach his team that he played professional Major League Baseball with, and they laughed at him. Here was the great Billy Sunday, and he went to the locker room to tell them about Jesus Christ, and they laughed him out of the locker room. You know what he said? That's okay. At least I warned him. I can't change a heart, but I sure can be that good Christian God called me to be. This is where Paul, something, the purpose of the early church and the purpose of the modern church has not changed. We are to spread the gospel. Go ye unto all the nations and teach them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. I can't change them, but I sure can teach them. Paul was the same way. You remember the book of Colossians was one of three letters that came from Paul's Roman imprisonment. The other two were Ephesians and Philemon. Read Paul's little letter to Philemon and see his attitude towards slavery. Just because Paul was writing to slavery you can see Philemon, he didn't agree with it. But he wanted to convert the heart. A Christian servant today, we may not have indentureship, serfs, slavery, but let's be honest. Sometimes I've worked for companies that treated me like a slave. Paid me very little, and work me to death. Who benefited? The boss. 
has it really changed much? We may not have slavery, but let's be honest, some of you have worked very hard for your life with very little return. We've seen how corporations, and this is not a political message, but we've seen how corporations have taken advantage of the little guy. But how are we as Christians to deal with this? How are we to be able to go on and go to work knowing? You know what the Bible says? The Christian servant owed complete obedience to those he serves under. If a Christian servant has a believing master, then the master, i.e. boss, was to treat him with the respect and the love that Jesus Christ had. But if not, he was to show singleness of heart, focus on the Lord, and give his full devotion to his boss. In our society, we have a, well, I deserve better attitude. Do we not? We have a, well, you don't know what he did to me, so if he's not going to treat me well, I'm not going to work well. I have heard so many excuses from Christians why they don't do what they do. There is no excuse. I can tell you some bosses today, but I worked my hardest. I've been passed over for promotion so many times it isn't funny. I've been lied about. I've been stepped upon. I've been cheated. I have lost my bonuses because of lies of others. But that's okay. You know what's great about that? It hurts. But God's keeping record. Amen. And you know what? It's hard to go to work without knowing God's on your side. It's hard to go to work knowing that you're not liked. It's hard to go to work sometimes knowing that you may not get all you want to get out of that company. But that's okay. Some things that kept me going was God's keeping record. God is keeping record. Singleness of hearts and sincere hearts are necessary for Christian employees to please God and serve their employers acceptably. The resulting here, we may not see the results we desire. But in heaven, you never know what's going to happen. Our complex and competitive world, it is sometimes difficult to be a Christian to obey God and hold his job or get a promotion. But we must obey God just the same and trust him for what he needs. Unsaved fellow employees may take advantage of a Christian worker, but perhaps this can be the opportunity for the Christians to witness and back up his witness with his life. It is far more important to win a lost soul than make a few extra dollars compromising our integrity. The Bible teaches Christians to have a godly work ethic that makes them the best possible employees and the most valuable employee, whether we get the sticker employee of the month or not. The Christians must live out their faith. Why? Faith without works is dead. At home, in the community, at church, out of the church, at school, at work, we are commanded to do as unto the Lord and not unto men. That is extremely difficult. When we're mistreated, when we're put down, and as a Christian in today's workforce, it's not getting easier to be a Christian. To say your political beliefs, can't do it. To say your spiritual beliefs, can't do it. You can't even say... As we see all over the news, a football coach in the United States, they're calling for his resignation because he says, I believe in the birth of a child. Because he's not pro-abortion, they want him to resign. He says, no, I'm not backing down. Do whatever you may. Folks, we see Christian athletes being made fun of because they will not play on Sunday or they will not do this or will not do that. Why? Well, they're a joke. But guess what? They're not backing down. People who flagrantly disobey the law, beat their spouse, drunken addicts, 
drug addicts, and just horrible players are revered as heroes for the kids. But if a Christian stands up for right, oh, he's pathetic. Remember all the things with Tim Tebow? He caught all the flack for being a Christian and wouldn't get this and wouldn't get that, and yet other football stars come along with rap sheets and all that. Oh, what a hero. Here's a young man that decided to wait until he got married, and they called him all sorts of names because he says, I'm going to stay pure until my wedding day. They made fun of him. And when he stood up, because he was given up for adoption, when he stood up for the unborn child, they called him against women's rights. Because someone loved him enough to birth him and give him to a family who loved him, who happened to be a missionary's family. You look at the story. What a, what a great story. What a hero story. But he's... Folks, we live in a world today that if we do right and we try to be right, we're made fun of. That's okay. God's keeping record. Those of us, as we labor to be married year after year, are considered an oddity. Those of us who have good work ethics are considered weird. Those of us that want to talk right, walk right, do right, we're considered weird. That's okay. We're doing it as unto the Lord, not unto the man. We're not here to be men pleasers, but God pleasers. Because you know what? My Lord has a great angelic scribe going, writing my story down. And he's writing their story down too. I'd rather him write it right, amen, than write it wrong. Because I can't go up there and go, um, Lord, excuse me, can you erase that for me? I, I didn't like that part of my life. You know what we do? We learn from those mistakes. You know what the devil's done a lot in my life? Made me regret it and regret it and regret it and regret it and regret it. But that doesn't change anything. That just makes me miserable. I make mistakes every day. I have not always been a perfect employee because my temper has got the best of me. My sourness has got the best of me in many things. But God had to work on me. Am I still perfect? No, I still have the flesh. There are days that the devil wins. You know why he wins? I let him. But I'm glad Jesus is victorious. Here's some things we ought to be as Christians. We're not to be lazy. I've seen too many people that their work ethics is sorry. Not to be lazy. Proverbs 18 verse 9. He also that is slothful in his work is a brother to him that is a great waster. Don't be a great waster. My dad talked about those men. And he said it was a shame. Many of them had great potential, but they became lazy because no one checked on them in the third shift to see if they were doing their job. He says other warehouses were beating us hands down with getting more production out. There was no excuse that they couldn't roll more trucks out. They just didn't. Man, I wouldn't want that. If I had the opportunity to put three trucks out at night instead of one, wouldn't I? I mean, don't you think I would get more raises? Don't you think I'd climb up the ladder? Hello? I mean, common sense shows me if the more production I do and if it's not killing me, my dad said it was easy. He said, you walk over to the pallet. This is Mark for Santa Barbara. And you jack it up and you drag it behind you to the next truck. You put it in there. It's not like we're lifting the crates. He says, we're wheeling them. And he goes, and then they started getting these things called forklifts. You know, <laughs> things before you and I were there. But hey, I've run forklifts. They're a lot of fun to run. You sit on with the headphones and you put the radio on there and you just drive around, beep, 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 and do your job and it's great. But I see some people sitting on the forklifts doing nothing. I've been at jobs where they just lean up against them like, I'd rather do something. And I've worked third shift. It is the longest, driest most boring shift. I want to get it done, folks. And sitting around doesn't help the time go by faster. I've done my fair share of third shifts. But you know, I see people sitting around. I was like, wait a minute. Everybody knows around 2 to 3 o'clock is the longest hour you've ever seen. It's just nothing's happened. It's quiet. We're not to be lazy. Proverbs 24 and verse 30. 
He says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. A man stands around looks at the plant growing but not helping the plants out. Paul says in Romans 12, 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 says, for even when you were with you, this we command you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. You know, when you think about our world today, if you don't work, you don't eat. I was reading an article the other day, and a, a lady was saying, you know, I come from another country that did not have a lot. And she says, as I moved to Vancouver, she goes, I realized we waste so much my country would have died for. She says, I have never seen so many lazy people expecting others to feed them. She says, my family worked for nothing to make a living. And my dad did. You know, it's bad when someone comes from another country and looks at ours and say, we're a great waster. We as a Christian nation or former Christian nation, should never be a waster of what God's blessed us with. We have people. I, I, it amazes me when W5 and um, these 60 Minutes and all these do whole exposés on panhandlers that stand in airports, stand on corners, collect money, and when no one's looking, they walk off, they take off their dirty clothes and put on nice clothes and get in their nice cars and drive off. They're doing it just to prey on the kindness of people. Instead of working, they're milking society. So every time I think about someone on the corner, I'm wondering, are they that person that's going to drive off in a Ferrari and I'm in a Ford? <laughs> you, know, at what, you know, I don't know because we can't trust anybody. And I look around. I remember in South Oshawa, people knocking on my door. And I would go answer and say, I want 20 bucks. I don't have a job. And I'm like, I just got a cup of coffee from McDonald's just across the street. And it says, now hiring. Oh, I can't work there. I have bailed cotton on the third shift. I have driven trucks. I have done things. I have put non-essential parts together really tiny parts, anything to make a living. I'm not afraid to put food on my table, even if it's beneath me. But you know what? Whatever God gives me is never beneath me. Amen? Amen. We all have to work somewhere. We've all, I guarantee if we all sat down and started talking about our first jobs, it was probably pretty hilarious some of our first jobs we did to get where God brought us. We started. My dad, my first job was paper routes. Many of us remember paper routes. You know, little kid with a bicycle throwing papers, that was me. Except I actually hit where I was throwing most of the time. But you know, we are not to be lazy. But the Bible says we're not to be self-centered about our Christ-centered work. You think about this. We're not to be self-centered about our Christ-centered work. Everything we do ought to be centered around Christ. Colossians 3.17, what does the Bible say? And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Giving thanks for what we have. Because to be honest, a lot of people can't get a job. Across this world, there are people that are looking for work and can't find it. We are blessed to have what we have. We're not to be lazy. We're not to be self-centered. We live in a world today where I'm not concerned about helping my employee. I used to have a drawing on my wall to remind me about what a leader is. A leader, and it showed a man climbing a mountain with a whole bunch of people trying to step on each other to get to the next and it says, world leader. And he just stepped on everybody to get to the top. 
and it says a godly leader. And it showed a man on the top of the mountain leaning down and helping the rest up. You know, it's not about me. Because if I honor God, if you honor God, God's going to take care of you. And I would rather every one of us to please God and get the benefits of God. Because we know that he owns the cattle on the thousand hills. We know that he does things far beyond a paycheck. You look around as a Christian. What has God done far more than monetary? Look at our house. Look at our family. Has our family been relatively good health? Have we had clothes on our back? Have we had food? Have we been warm in the winter? Have we had the cars? Some of you are like me. We like to keep our cars. And the longevity that our cars are kept, it's a blessing. I see other people, brand new cars, they're breaking down all the time. And it's like, here's my 2010. I got my problems, but hey, coming on 200,000 kilometers, still running good. Got his fair share of rust, but hey, we live in Ontario. But it still gets me to Walmart, to church, to have, you know, everywhere else I need to go. Still gets me down the highway. I don't need the new things. But if God chooses to bless me with new things, I'll be thankful. I don't need the greatest NAM brand clothes. They rip and tear just like the Levi's do. You know, people look around and they say, well, I got to have this. Does it make us any better? To have a Walmart purse or a Gucci purse? 500 bucks for a purse? 100 bucks? I was on eBay the other day and I saw this huge price tag. I said, I wonder what this is. It was a leather wallet for $1,000. Can I tell you, my $5 wall, uh, Amazon wallet has done good for six years. <laughs> you know, it's $1,000. I don't even have $1,000 to buy a wallet to put what in it. I don't know. But I'm thinking to myself, that's stupid. It probably cost $5 to make, if that. But I look around, people are so self-centered, they're so focused on getting the next thing, they don't see the people around them. But here's something, sadly, we're not to be jealous with others in the workforce. I've seen so many people in my life get so upset when Mrs. So-and-so gets a bigger bonus than Mr. So-and-so. But I've seen Mrs. So-and-so work over Mr. So-and-so. <laughs> and I'm thinking, she deserves double. Yes, give it to her. But I've heard grumbling. Well, I don't know what she's doing. I've seen what employees pay secretaries, and it's a shame. I've seen employees, how they treat secretaries and office staff, and it's really a shame. I've seen the work that some of those people do. I've seen labor force, what they've treated them. A manager does not deserve sometimes 10 times what the employee that's actually making it. I've seen some weird pay scales and I've looked at it. What is he doing? Is he really worth that much? Is she really worth that much? And I've seen people pay him because that's the brother of so-and-so, that's the sister of so-and-so, so they deserve. No, no. I thank everyone and sadly, the greatest perpetrator of bad employee is the Christian circles. If you've ever seen what a Christian school teacher makes, a Christian secretary makes, it's pathetic. You ever see what people pay pastors and pastor staff, the amount of work they do, it's pathetic. The church ought not to be. This is the way I've always felt. That's why we do the things at Christmas for everybody. That's why we do. We are serving the Lord, the King of Kings. And if someone is paid here to work, they ought to get equally what you're paid out there. We should never underchange them. And we should never bring them to the point of jealousy where they desire what's out there more than what's here. I want people to work in a Christian church. I want people to be paid equally where they can actually make a living and not starve to death. Why? 
I think the Bible applies to masters and servants the same. If the church becomes a master, an employer, it ought to pay its employees exactly what a secretary would make or more out there. This is how I feel. I believe you can never outgive God. Amen? We serve a God that will do what He says He will do. Amen. And we should never bring someone to jealousy. Matthew chapter 20. We all know the parable where everybody's hired at a certain type of day. This guy says, I'll work for a penny. He starts at nine. Guy comes at 12. I'll work for a penny. Guy comes at three at the end of the year. I'll work for a penny. And the guy who starts at nine gets mad at the guy who starts at three because he hired on for the same amount. Hey, I admit there's some employees a whole lot better than I am. <laughs> they got a whole lot more brains. I am basically works with my hands and not with my brains. And there are people that deserve more than I do. We ought not to be jealous, especially of our world, because we're not going to be treated fairly most of the time if we start standing for what's right. But that's okay. Like I said, God's keeping record. We live in a world where we ought not to be jealous of others in the workforce. If we've agreed to a salary, we put our signature. Let God take care of us. But notice in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28, we're not to be thieves. The Bible says here in verse, chapter 4 and verse 28, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Christians should never partake in taking from a company. We should always, that means time. When I was a boss, if the job was eight to five, and most of the time it was, I expected my employees, wasn't bad to me to expect, that they'd be there at eight o'clock, amen? And they'd be at five. You know, but I've seen so many people that sadly, they milk the clock. And as Christians, they think nothing of it. I'm glad I've worked with some good Christian men and women that have done their best to make sure they give every moment of the time they're hired to their boss. I've been with Christians that say, well, I deserve this piece of property. No, we don't. If we didn't pay for it, we didn't deserve it. You know, I was laughing with a bank employee the other day she was at the front of Scotia and she was putting pins out with chains. And she, she goes, you know how many big pins we go through in a week? <laughs> she goes, people just ask me, oh, it's the bank, it's free. And she said, I had my pin on my desk that my mother gave me and the lady did not have it. And so I gave it to her to sign the back of her check and she puts it in her purse. She goes, excuse me, that's my pen. She goes, the bank's got more of them. She goes, no, that's my pen. And if you take it, you're stealing. And she indignantly gave it back. She goes, I, unbelievable, the nerve of the lady. But her response was, oh, the bank's got more of them. Our attitude today is like, oh, that's no problem. She goes, hits the chains. <laughs> You know, it's just like, if it's not yours, it's not yours. Amen. Leave it where you found it. Yeah. But we have a society where, eh, they have plenty of them. Ah, a stapler, oh, no problem. Oh, time, no problem. They won't know. I mean, look, they get my work out. You know, there should never be any excuses to steal what's not ours. We are a living testimony. We're to be focused on our work, not on the companies, i.e., busybodies. And that you study to be quiet and do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded. Verse after verse, the Bible teaches about good work ethics, godly work ethics, giving it your all, being salt and light, 
being ambassadors. There are so many things God teaches about biblical work ethics. Will we all get it at once? No. Will we all be 100% successful in being the best Christian? I wish. But like I said, I've lost my temper. I've done things I shouldn't have. But I'm glad God says in 1 John 1, 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins. You know the greatest thing I've been able to do to former employees? I'm sorry. An apology, a sincere apology goes a long way. I knew better and I did it and I'm sorry. I've asked God forgiveness and I'm asking your forgiveness. I've seen bosses just sit back and it's hard. You know why? P-R-I-D-E. The pride of Gordon is very big. And to walk in there and go, I royally messed up. Would you forgive me? Why are you asking me to forgive me? Because I've asked the Lord to forgive me and I'm asking you to forgive me. I understand if you won't. But will you? You know, it just being real. My wife will tell you I've not always had the easy jobs. I've not always been treated fairly. But they were jobs God gave me. And you know what? They may, met our needs, helped us to buy our first house, buy our cars, take care of our living. But they were not easy jobs. But God allowed me as the time went on, as I surrendered my life little by little to Him, to be witnesses. That's the greatest thing. Even here, whatever I do, whether for the farmers, whether I do for my community, whether I do here, I do the best of my ability. That's why I burn out, because I refuse to put half labor into God's house. I want God's house to be the very best house in the world. If I can do it for my house, I'm surely going to do it for God's house. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5.10, I love this verse. He's talking about Timothy's parents. Well reported of, for good works. If she had brought up children, if she had lawed strangers, if she had washed the saints' feet, if she had relieved the afflicted, if she had diligently followed every good work. Talking about the elderly women in the church. And I was reading one commentator and I never thought about this. You know who the model for this woman was? Lois and Eunice. Timothy's grandmother and mother. Because he said he brought them up and he's telling Timothy, the model you have is your mother and grandmother. They have been reported for their good works. They have done this. They have done that. And that ought to be the model for all of the elderly to follow. The widows. If she had brought up children, if she had lodged strangers, if she had washed the saints' feet, if she had relieved the afflicted, if she had diligently followed every good work. Think about that. That's a lot of work. Washing feet, Lodging strangers, running a, running a hotel is what she was doing. Man, anybody that runs an Airbnb says it's a lot of work. It's something I wouldn't want to do. But people have to be ingenious to be able to make a living today. If she had relieved the afflicted, in other words, she was helping the poor. Giving of what she had to help others. If she diligently followed every good work, whatever she did, she was not only a mother, she was an entrepreneur. <laughs> she was a caregiver and a good Samaritan. But I love how it says, we're well reported of for good works. May we, no matter what people say about us, may our works speak louder than our words. And that's the greatest Christian ethics if we just follow not to be lazy, not to be self-centered, not to be a jealous employee, focused on our work and not everybody else's, and focused on being Christ-centered, not self-centered. These are just some of the work ethics that Christ leaves as a pattern for us 
in the work field. If we have a godly work ethic, if we give it our all, and we be the light and the ambassador God would have to be, you'll reach people. I've told you this story many times about how when I worked for Keystone Industries, we had one employee that kind of made fun of me, especially after I surrendered to preach in November 2003. I really wanted God's direction, and I would sit and read during my lunch hour. I had 45 minutes, and a sandwich doesn't take that long to eat. And so I would read and say, God, where do you want me to be? And I had two countries on my heart to come back to, Haiti and my home in Canada. And I was praying because I was challenged by a man at church to pray where God would have me. And I wanted to make sure, so I was just reading, and he'd go, oh, what's that going to do for you? He'd make all just the crude joke. He'd come from a Christian background. His father was a missionary. But he had rebelled so much, he'd become just like the world. And he just made, it's almost like, would you just be quiet? He would be annoying. This went on for months. Every time I'd work back with him, he would just make the job miserable. Then my boss finally moved me up into the sales department, and he called me all sorts of names because I got up to the sales department. But that's what I was, a salesman. But I started in the back. Every time I turned around, there was always something said about me. I'd walk in the back to give an order, and everybody would be, psh, 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 just, you know they were talking to me. It just didn't want to go. One day I had to work late to close a large deal with Coca-Cola in Chattanooga. And I had to get an order. Most of them stayed late, and he was one of them, and they started leaving. And as I finished the order, I went back to the break room and went to my locker to get my stuff. And I closed the locker door, and there he was standing with tears in his eyes. And he said, I know I've been a jerk. He said, but I found out my dad has cancer, and it's not good. He says, if anybody could pray and get a prayer to heaven. Would you please pray for him? You know, that, met, that made all the ridicule, all the things better. And in that break room, we bowed our head, and I prayed that God would touch his father. My wife knew his father. I knew his father. But his son went off this direction. But you know, it just showed me that living for Christ has a reason. It has a purpose. And people are watching. And you are a reminder of what people should be. If you're a good work employee, it reminds them of what they should be. And they want you to be like them so they'll feel better. That's what it boils down to. So don't be like them. Be like Christ. And if someone rises on you for being who you are, that's because they know they should be just like you. Just be God's servant wherever we are. And be thankful. No matter what we have, be thankful for what we have. Amen. In all ways, glorify God at work. And if we lift Christ up, He will lift us up. But let Him do the lifting. And us do the needing. Trust God in everything we do and live for Him. And in eternity, we'll see what God had in store for us. Let's be faithful to be in that biblical work ethic because people don't know what biblical work ethic like they used to. We need to show them again we like being hard workers. It fulfills who we are. May God help us tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, we live in a world that is a self-centered me generation. Lord, we live in a world that wants to fix everybody else and their problems, but not ours. We live in a world that wants to write everything but ourselves. 
Lord, as a child of God, help us to humble ourselves and become the child of God you would have us be and work as unto you and not as men. Not being men pleasers, but being God pleasers. That we may be a Joseph in this world. That even in the midst of false accusations, it is still false. And may we hold our head high knowing that we have not lost our integrity. That we have not damaged our testimony. Lord, we need you every step of the way because we're mere humans, frail and faulty. Lord, I ask you that you just watch over each and every one that heads to work in the morning, that you would remind us that we're working as unto our Father and to leave a testimony everywhere we go. Thank you for all you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for this book of Colossians. Lord, I can't imagine being a small Christian minority in a vast sea of ungodly. Lord, I can't imagine being surrounded with such immorality and false religions and open disrespect for anybody and anything. But yet Paul says, I've been faithful. Lord, help us to be like Paul in our day and age. May you, through us, be able to impact the people that we work with, people that we are neighbors to, community that we're in. May we be that light shining in our small corner. Give us the strength we need day by day. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name, amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. May the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing each and every one of you Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Lord bless and have a great night.